Hey, welcome to Whatcha Doin' with Brandon Horwin and Sophie Williams. And today's special guest is... Hi, everybody. I'm Heidi Blickenstaff. I am a lot of things. Uh, right now, I am a wife and a stepmom and a mom to my dog. But uh, when I'm not inside the pandemic, I'm a Broadway actress and I've done some TV and movies here and there. And I'm super thrilled to talk to you guys today. Great. Well, welcome to What You Doing, and thanks for joining us. We're thrilled to have you today. Thank you very, very much for asking. I'm happy to be with you guys. <laughs> Great. Well, I just want to ask our standard um, introduction question because I love to hear um, the response. And it's just, can you please tell us a little bit about your journey to theater, sort of how you got your start, where all the roads took you to up until today? Let's go away back to then, shall we? Um, uh, my journey, let's see. Well, um, I was born and raised in Fresno, California, which is right smack dab in the middle of uh, California. And um, uh, my parents, uh, thank God, have always been very supportive of me being a total musical theater weirdo, um, but they themselves were not well versed in how to deal with an alien such as myself. Um, they were more uh, sports leaning and, you know, my dad coached my soccer team for as long as I stayed interested in that. And um, my mom's a teacher, my dad's a lawyer. And um, they're all still in Fresno, California. Hi, everybody. And my brother, I have an older brother who's about two and a half years older. And uh, um, my mother would tell you that um, from a very, very young age, I started showing my musical theater alien tendencies. Like she would play um, mostly Barbra Streisand records. She's a big Barbra Streisand fan, as am I now too. And um, I was absolutely um, mystified by the sounds that not only the record player would make, but that Barbara would make. Mm -hmm. And I, I was harmonizing, so my mom says, with Barbara from about the age of two. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to hold out the notes as long as Barbara Streisand could hold out the notes like in um, ageless and ever, ever greed. And I would like try to hold, and I'm two. Um, and my mom was like, what are we gonna do with this strange alien child? Um, and they threw me in dance class, which was a very wise decision. Um, I did play sports a lot growing up, but um, I always long, even, even before I knew there was a Broadway, I was leaning toward doing all kinds of performing arts things. Um, the singing oddly came much later. I mean, I sang with Barbara, but I first was a dancer and was much, much more interest, interested in that. And um, it, eventually went to a performing arts high school Roosevelt Performing Arts High School, Fresno, California. A lot of really amazing people have come through that program, including Audra McDonald, who was a couple years ahead of me. Um, Audra and I were friends all growing up and carpooled together. And um, it's sort of, it, it, it's, there were lots of people that went through that program that ended up doing lots and lots of Broadway shows. So that was a very wonderful program, still is. And after I graduated, I had a moment where I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to be a lawyer like my dad, daddy issues. And um, uh, I sort of miraculously got into Duke University, um, not to sell myself short. I'm like, I'm, just, I'm a smart cookie. And, um, and uh, it, it didn't take me long to realize, at first I thought I was going to um, definitely like be on a, on a track to go to law school. And I was, took public policy classes and just was like super interested in, in all things, sociology, politics, still am. Um, but it was about, I don't know, I, halfway through my freshman year, I was like, who am I kidding? And um, I, it, Duke is not necessarily known for having a kick-ass drama program, but they do have one. And um, I sort of, of course, my little performing arts leanings was like, hey, all three of you, can I be in your club? And so I ended up being a drama major at Duke University. 
And, um, and then, uh, like the song says, uh, I packed up a U-Haul upon graduation and I drove to New York City with a couple of my friends. And um, I moved in with a high school girlfriend of mine who was pursuing a modeling career. And um, while she was, you know, hitting the pavement, going to go sees, and it was such a glamorous world to me, I was waiting tables at Ellen Stardust Diner. Um, which is still there. I, don't, I wonder if they're open right now, but I think they're still there. It's a New York institution. If you don't know Ellen Stardust Diner, it's like, it's right on Broadway. And is it 51st maybe? It's right where at the time Cats was there. Cats <laughs> was there forever and ever. And now Music Man will be in there next. Um, but uh, it's just this like 50s themed diner that also is home to a bunch of starving artists um, who sing for their supper. And um, it's a singing wait staff. And, you know, that was, those, were, those were some amazing days in my early 20s. In my early 20s. And um, it didn't take me long. I was probably there less than a year and I booked the national tour of the Who's Tommy. And thus would begin my, my um, <laughs> I had a long stint of doing national tours um, for about, I mean, mostly on, slightly off, but mostly on for a decade, I did national tours. And it was there that I definitely um, like, uh, cut my teeth as a professional actor. And I was mostly a dancer first. And I would also, because I could sing, I hadn't been ignoring my voice, but um, my passion first was dancing. And um, so I was mostly like in the dance ensemble um, of Tommy. I did a production of Dream Girls that was headed back to New York, never came back to New York. I played one of the white girls, the Cadillac girls, of course. Um, that was my choreography, in case you didn't know. <laughs> um, and, and then somewhere in the middle of all of that, I realized that though I was, I was a really athletic dancer and I definitely like went for it and I was pretty good, I wasn't great. And as you're starting to sculpt your Broadway career, you look around and there are so many thoroughbreds around you that you're like, okay, that person is like other level and I'll never be that person. And I secretly don't want to be that person um, just because I just knew that that wasn't in me and it would take so much work for me to be as good as those Broadway dancers are. And so I started kind of um, honing in on a different skill set and meaning um, I, I tried to give myself more confidence when it came to singing. It's so weird now because I think of myself now as a singer actor first. I'm old too and I don't want to dance anymore at all but, um, <laughs> but um, it's so funny that for such a long time I did not um, that I was so passionate about dancing that I didn't really, I, I, I always thought of myself as a singer, but not as much as other people did. And um, still to this day, the things that thrill me the most, it, it's always dance on stage. I'm always like, oh my God. Like I, that's, that's the stuff that just makes me insane in a great way. Um, I just always have been so attracted to um, all different kinds of movement. Anyway, though I have no skill at being a choreographer. Um, so anyway, I started focusing more on the singing and the actressing and the joke telling and realized that there was that, that lived, that was alive and well in me too. And I started understudying a lot and, um, I, you know, job after job after job, I was generally in the ensemble, but covering whoever the female lead was. And those were great days because I learned a lot. I didn't have all the pressure because I also secretly, and we may talk about this later, I am a super anxious performer. Always have been since I was a little kid. And um, it just goes hand in hand with me. And a lot of performers are, are like this. You know, some people just, you know, being on stage is 
home for them. And at some point in all of that, I um, decided to sort of segue out of focusing on the dancing Heidi and into the, the singing, acting, telling jokes Heidi. And, um, and it, it definitely, it was a great decision, but I um, also, it, it was difficult for me because I was comfortable being in the ensemble dancing and, and kind of forcing myself out of that was pushing myself out of my comfort zone, which actually activated a lot of anxiety for me. And I know a lot of performers um, walk hand in hand with anxiety. It sort of comes along with the territory. And um, I definitely am one of those performers. Um, it's something that I, uh, I, I, I mean, struggle with is the first thing that comes to mind, but I've been living with it for such a long time. It's sort of like, I'm, I'm living with it. It's sort of, I've, it's like, sounds like a disease, but in a way it kind of is. Um, but I have now come to like, I've got all my, I've got my great bag of tricks and I deal with it, but it is something that um, I, I deal with as a performer and I probably always will. But as a younger performer, it definitely like was a bigger monster than it is today. So I had to navigate not only trusting myself as a singer actor, but also navigating through all of this self doubt and anxiety that was just sort of like bubbling up. And that was something, that was something. Um, but more on that later. Anyway, so I, I um, started gaining more confidence out on the road. And then there was a shift. There was a moment when I was about, I guess I was in my, like around 30, maybe I wasn't quite 30 yet. And um, I booked the national tour again of um, the full Monty. And I was super excited because that show was currently playing on Broadway. And um, I went out on the road with it. I was in the ensemble. I was understudying one of the wives, one of the, the principal wives. And um, then September 11th happened and we all got sent home. And not only did all the tours in the United States of America get sent home, but the Broadway shows even shut down at least for a couple of weeks, if not longer. Um, but when the show reopened on Broadway, um, eventually they asked me to come in and um, play the part that I had been playing on the road. Um, would, they, would I come in? And I was like, um, no, of oh, yes, of course, I'll be there. Like, yes, I'm coming, I'm coming to Broadway. And I made my Broadway debut in the full Monty, but was what was fascinating about my debut um, was that, so I was playing, my ensemble character's name was Susan Hershey. Love, love me some Susan, Susan Hershey. Um, but I was understudying Vicki Nichols uh, that was being played brilliantly by the genius Emily Skinner, who I had been a huge, huge, huge fan of like my entire career. As long as I knew there was an Emily Skinner, I was a fan of hers. And, and part of it was because I, you know, when I saw Emily and heard Emily like in Sideshow and all the other things she did, I was like, I'm like that. I'm like her. You know, I think a lot of times we see people that that inspire us, but also we see ourselves in people. And Emily was really one of the first people for me that I was like, I'm like her. Okay, so I get this call to come into the Broadway show. And Emily had was out because of an illness. And so I made my Broadway debut in Emily Skinner's dressing room with Emily Skinner's mic on my back playing Emily Skinner's part. And it all happened so fast, no one could come and see me. I made my Broadway debut completely like on my own. It was, it was so surreal and so perfect. And um, Emily would go on to be out for, for a little bit. So I, I op my Broadway debut was playing a principal on Broadway for, I don't know how many performances, but it was several. And then I went back to being in the ensemble and I was like, phew, that was a lot of pressure. That was a lot. And I was like, like faking it until I made it. Like totally, I didn't really know. I didn't, I remember being out there going, I, I don't I, I'm on Broadway, I'm on Broadway. And I couldn't believe it. And with Emily, Emily's mic on my back, this person who I had heard, I will never leave you. And I, I, my head would explode every night. And I was on stage with the guys who were on the cast album. And it just like, 
one of the crazy things about being, having made it to Broadway, having dreamt it as a kid, I, I think all of us have dreams of doing things. And the crazy thing about being on Broadway is that if you make it, you are suddenly in the pool with all of these people that you have been idolizing, not five years before in your dorm room, you know, listening to Secret Garden over and over. And now I'm doing a concert with Rebecca Luker. Like it, it, it is so weird to um, have that be your reality. And it is never ever lost on me that I get to perform with these people that I so, um, idolized and and like patterned my how I do what I do like how would Judy Kuhn handle this high note literally and then I'm like I'm at a benefit with Judy Kuhn and she goes first and then I go and I'm like how did this happen how who did I fool to get into this position but that was my entire full Monty experience um and I just have never lost my wonder of it my awe of it and I'm sure I never will, because it just is so bananas that I get to do what I dreamt as a little kid. Um, and after after I did Vicky on Broadway, whenever Emily was out and played Susan normally, um, eventually the tour amped up again. And when the tour amped up again, they offered me Vicky. And so I went out and that was really my first big professional role. Um, and after that, it all was just sort of like, everything kept kind of coming. I mean, after that, um, Mermaid happened. And even though I was standing by for Sherry, Renee Scott, who played Ursula brilliantly, um, and that standby position eventually turned into an onstage position. That's a whole other long story. Um, but uh, I had told myself after I did the full Monty on the road and I played the principal part. I was like, no more, no more, no more understudying, no more um, in ensemble roles. You, you have to like figure out how you're gonna sculpt your career. And like, right when that happened, I got offered Mermaid to, to stand by for Sherry. And I was like, I'm not gonna turn this down. And what was amazing, every step you take, I'm telling you like, it's, your your road is there for you. Your your job is to just take the steps. And certainly, when you're a un younger actor, it, say yes, say yes to the world, say yes to the universe. And I said yes to that job, even though I told myself I wasn't going to do that again. But from Mermaid, while I was doing Mermaid, because I was covering Sherry and had much, I didn't have those big responsibilities. I didn't have to sing Poor Unfortunate Souls eight shows a week. That was when I started building title of show with my crazy friends. And that show changed my life. And um, for those of you that don't know title of show, title of show was a, a show that um, I collaborated on with my dear friends, Jeff Bowen, Hunter Bell, Susan Blackwell, Michael Barras and Larry Presgrove. And we essentially wrote a show about writing the show you're watching. And if that doesn't break your brain, God bless America. It was, it was very meta, and um, and we got you know we got into a little music festival the very first year of the New York Musical Theater Festival, and from there we got uh, we were all sort of uh, gobsmacked. Uh, Kevin McCollum, who is a big time Broadway producer optioned us. I didn't even know what that was at the time. I was like, we've been optioned. What does that mean? Um, and uh, he sent us to different places to continue to write. And um, we would write and then we would do a little showing for, for little theaters in New York. And the Vineyard picked us up and I, the Vineyard will forever be, you know, uh, my favorite off-Broadway Haven. I, I, I'm forever a vineyard girl. And uh, we got an off Broadway run with the vineyard. And, you know, the interesting thing with Mermaid was that in my contract um, for Mermaid, I had, I had um, basically said, I don't want anything special. I don't need a bajillion dollars. I didn't fight for a big uh, salary because the one thing I wanted was to be able to get out of my contract if title of show went to Broadway. 
And um, I think all of my dear friends over at Disney were sort of like, that's never going to happen. So yeah, we'll give that to her. <laughs> because nobody ever, ever thought the title of show was going to take one step beyond our living room. And, and then it had all of these little weird steps along the way, including an off-Broadway run, including a YouTube series. And then by the grace of God, uh, we were told that we were gonna go to Broadway and right at that moment, and PS, this was like five years in the making. And um, I know my timeline's kind of all over the place, but the thing that did intersect was I was doing Mermaid at the time that title of show was, um, we got the news, the title of show was going to play the Lyceum on Broadway. And not only did I get out of my contract at Mermaid, but everybody over at the Lunt Fontan where Mermaid was happening, everybody at Disney, on Broadway, they could not have been more supportive, more thrilled, because it was a little bit like the little engine that could. Title of show was this show that was never supposed to do anything. And um, now suddenly we're having a Broadway run all because the, the six of us never gave up. And it, and it had this heart of gold, you know, this it, title of show, if you don't know it, is a, these four friends are just trying to build a dream. And um, and at the end of the show, their dream comes true of being able, of getting their show produced. And um, and I think that a lot of theater people and a lot of non theater people felt connected to the dreaminess and the dream coming true part of these friends that made it happen. And whether you were a musical theater nerd or whether you were somebody who like was dreaming of going to med school or if you wanted to quit working for that bank and start painting, people were very inspired by the message of title of show, which is, oh God, now I have to say the message of title of show. But basically it was, it was like, when you make something with people you love, anything is possible. And dream your dreams, little dreamers. And and if you work hard and you you keep that that um, if it, I don't know if your heart is pure and you do things with good intentions, your dreams can come true. And I think so many people were like, oh, "Me too, me too." So Disney on Broadway just basically they they loved me right on out the door and um title of show happened and it was a miracle uh that it happened period but we all play ourselves in that show and so what it did for all of us was that if the community if like the casting community if the if any any anyone in the creative making musical part and even tv shows it, it, those people came to see the show and suddenly we all had the best calling card in the world because we were playing ourselves. And um, so people felt like they got to know us in those 90 minutes and suddenly everything changed. And that thing that every actor just like dreams about, I mean, as if it's not, as if it's not enough to like dream I want to be on Broadway and you get to be on Broadway but then the other thing that an actor wants is that moment where they are um you know where people know who they are not in, I was never interested in fame I'm still not interested in that um uh but I but that moment where you're not just constantly like clawing 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 um people knew who we were so when so title of show was this critical success we got a great review in the times which was amazing and um we were sort of this darling um of of the theater community for a second however as you can probably imagine no one came to see it um nobody no tourists were interested in this tiny little show that was literally about four friends and a guy on a keyboard no orchestra no pyro no helicopter landing no camels on stage nothing it was just us and this story about a dream that we're hoping comes true and you know, if we got people there, it, they always loved it. 
but it was really hard to get people there. And also, you know, we didn't have Hugh Jackman. We didn't have anybody, it was just us. So um, the show opened in July and closed in October. So that's not that long, but it was long enough for us to, um, you know, become known in the industry, which was amazing. And in that time, Sherry Renee Scott, who was playing Ursula, what her contract was up over at Mermaid. And so, whereas I think before, had I not done title of show, and I could be wrong about this, but I think had I not done title of show, they probably would have cast someone you know, with a Tony award at least, or a movie star or whomever to come in and play Ursula because so many amazing people could have played that part. But because right at that moment, title of show had shifted the earth around all of us, they asked me to come and take over for Sherry. And so I did. And that was amazing and terrifying because to play Ursula, you have to have some big, big, big sea witch balls, which I had not developed my balls yet. Um, and that would come. But again, I was thrown into a situation where I had to fake it until I made it. And, um, and that began my relationship with Disney theatrical, Disney on Broadway. Oh, okay. And, um, you know, then luckily after that, I had a, a, a string of Broadway jobs, Adam's Family, um, Something Rotten. And that led me into doing Freaky Friday for Disney, which, which they weren't sure at the time when we were building it where it might end up and it was possible that it could end up on Broadway, but then Disney Channel got involved and I ended up being able to do the movie for Disney Channel. So it's been an amazing ride and continues to be an amazing ride. Um, but there, there's my, there's my long, short story. For you. <laughs> it's amazing. And thank you for sharing all of that with us. And I think we're going to definitely delve more into some of it, which is yeah. starting out. That leads me to my next um, question about your most recent Broadway um, credit, which is Something Rotten, and yeah. which I was obsessed with. I saw it three times and you were oh. amazing every time. Oh, thank you. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about, you know, creating this role from scratch in Something Rotten and then bouncing off of that, was this show as fun to perform as it looked? Yes, I'll, I'll answer your last question first. The answer is yes. Um, that, that show for me was um, kind of an embarrassment of riches. Uh, the people that I got to be on stage with, um, it, the material was so, so, uh, so beautifully written by two guys who had never written a Broadway musical before and three guys actually. And um, uh, I don't know, it was, a, it was remarkable. It was not without its uh, challenges for sure because I was the very last person cast. And you've talked to a lot of fancy Broadway people and I'm sure that it's come up that, you know, making a Broadway show, just like how I was saying with title of show that it took five years, it takes a long time for a show to make it to Broadway. And then it also takes some kind of crazy fairy dust for a Broadway show to succeed. Um, but uh, Something Rotten was in development God, I mean, for like, I think by the time it actually opened on Broadway, I think it had been in some stage of development for a decade. And um, uh, the Kirkpatrick brothers uh, had known Kevin McCollum. You know, a, a lot of this is about relationships, kids. Uh, it, 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 really, it really does not always come down to that, but a lot of times it does because if you've had a super great experience, with a producer, a director, a, a composer, those people don't forget that. And, um, you know, a lot of my career, I've been a repeat offender with, with you know, composers, producers, directors. And I actually, um, I ended up getting the phone call to do something rotten from Casey Nicola after who directed something rotten 
not long after I had done a production of Most Happy Fella at City Center and had this really amazing experience playing Cleo in um, uh, an encore's production of Most Happy Fella that Casey directed. And not long before that, I'm gonna blow your mind, I had spent five years in the developmental workshops of the Book of Mormon. Am I exaggerating? Was it two and a half years? Sometimes I get that. I, I conflate two jobs of mine, but I was, I was in all of the workshops of the Book of Mormon playing the mom to Andrew Reynolds. I know I don't look like I'm, I'm not old enough. Uh. Wigs, makeup, whatever. Um, but uh, up until the, the very, very last Broadway workshop, I was in it. And um, at the very end of the last Broadway workshop, they, I got a call from the producer. And over the years that, that we were in development with it, like my part kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. If you look at the Mormon coffee table book, I'm in there people, find me. Um, uh, but I got a call from Ann Garofino, who's like the best, one of the best producers I have ever worked with. Um, she called me and she was like, well, your part is now basically written out. And I had before I had like songs and scenes and an arc and all kinds of stuff. And she was like, we've basically, we're writing you out, but it's not because we don't love you. Um, all Now all of the white females in the show are going to be played by boys. Um, and I do remember she kind of gave me a choice. She was like, if you want to be in it, you can be Darth Vader. At one point, Darth Vader comes on. You'll, you'd be in it for like six minutes or we can part as friends that love each other. And I was, it was the classiest way to like essentially fire someone. <laughs> but Casey had directed that and Casey and I had this great relationship from that. And then we had this great relationship from Most Happy Fella. And then I, the crazy thing happened to me which was I got the miracle phone call, which you never get ever. I mean, maybe if, I don't know, you're Hugh Jackman, you don't get any, I mean, you have to use the phone if you're Hugh Jackman, but I think everything is basically offered to you. Um, but I had never been straight up offered anything. And basically what had happened was that Something Rotten had been in development forever and um, they were going to have an out of town run in Seattle, a pre-Broadway run. And because the last workshop, which I was not in, um, went so well, uh, they decided they were gonna skip the out of town. Kevin McCollum is very ballsy and he felt like the show was ready and they were gonna skip the out of town and um, just go straight in to the St. James on Broadway. And the role of B, which was previously played by one of my favorite actresses ever, and I'm not gonna name her. Um, she's a friend of mine, so talented, but she's a little older than I am. And they wanted to give the character of B, they essentially wanted to make her pregnant um, because they, the character of Nick Bottom, her husband, they wanted to give him, they wanted to raise his stakes. They wanted to put more pressure on him. So with a pregnant wife, he feels, I have to do this, I have to do this, and it raise his, raises his stakes. So they wanted an actress who was, you know, equally capable of doing all the things this other amazing actress did before me, but was just a little bit younger and could pull off being pregnant. And um, so Casey called me and I was literally in my dressing room at Paper Mill Playhouse doing Elf and it was like, I don't know, half hour. And Casey called me. I'm like, why are you calling me? And he was like, I want you to play B in something rotten. And at the time, I still thought they were going to Seattle. And I was like, okay, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So we're going to Seattle. And he was like, no, I'm offering you a principal in a Broadway show. <laughs> and even as I say it now, it like, I feel like I could burst into tears because it's so rare that that happens that you just get offered a Broadway show when you're at half hour for your other show in New Jersey. And um, I, you know, I couldn't believe it. It was bananas again. Like, this is my life. How can this be my life? Um, 
needless to say, I'm sure I didn't let him finish what he was saying. And I said, yes. And so we started, we started rehearsal. So I was the last one there and all of these actors that I admire so much. And I love them. Christian Borrell, Brooks Ashmanskis, Brian Darcy James. It's like an embarrassment of riches. I like, I was so freaked out because they had been with each other for a long time. And I was like the new girl and everybody loved the girl that I was replacing, so did I. And coming into that show, and also they were completely changing B's story. Everything else was basically the same, except B's storyline was like, they threw it out and they were rewriting. And so the writers would take me out to lunch and be like, okay, tell us about yourself, go. What, 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 what do you do when you're funny? Like, how do you sing? Like where, like they were trying to write for me. And I was like, um, 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 like I was freaked out. I was so, I was like, uh, how did I get here transported into this moment? And the good news was, was that everybody was so loving and kind. It was such a group of awesome people. And I will tell you, you've probably heard this before from other people you've interviewed is that as I get into these rooms that are more and more unbelievable to me, by and large, the cream rises to the top. You can't get into those rooms if you are an asshole. And so generally, once you get there, everybody is not only at the top of their game, but they're also really like lovely human beings not doesn't it's not 100 percent true but but generally speaking um and certainly with something rotten um i could not have been in the room with lovelier people um that having been said i was still wildly intimidated and um it took me a long time to get into my boots like to to you know find my ursula balls again and um, figure out how to play her because she's, she's a badass, but she's also like the warm, sincere center. I mean, I, I don't wanna be so bold as to say she's the center of the show cause she's not, but, but there is something, you know, there's so many hijinks, there's all this waka waka stuff going on. And when you get to be, it's, it's a little like gentler, warmer, real and, um, so it was fascinating trying to be like the rock when I was like dying. I was like, ah, ah, how did I get here? <laughs> and so it was, that was a super duper challenge. And I must say one more thing. I know I talk forever. One more thing about B was that when we were in previews because they were writing B on the fly, we had, I believe because the show was kind of ready to go except for B, uh, I think we had five weeks in the rehearsal studio, five weeks. And then we had, uh, we had, I don't know how many weeks of tech, probably two. And then we went right into previews. And because it was so abbreviated, they were writing for me up until opening night of a Broadway play show musical and I um lost easily 15 pounds I was basically like a nervous wreck the entire time because as we've discussed I'm already I, I come to the party just like ready to shit myself and um and every day literally they were changing my lines <laughs> no one else's lines because that was all like you know set in stone but um they were trying to figure out B's arc and I had a whole other song in the second act cut oh that was a dark day and um it's a beautiful song you can find it on YouTube it's called lovely love it's such a glorious song um but they felt like it sort of derailed the fast-paced storytelling and the comedy and the way they said it and I remember crying 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 um but uh they said we all love the song we all may love that song the most but the show hates the song like the the rhythm of the show of the show just didn't and it, they were they were right of course but oh god that was a heartbreaker but um they they put a reprise of right hand man 
the the Brandon you know you saw it three times um mm -hmm. in the second act and um the scene is between Nigel and B and every single night of previews, they changed that scene. They changed the lyrics to the song. And so I would go on stage with uh, having written Sharpie bullet points on my hand. It's a true story, Broadway actress, mm -hmm. pro professional. And I would like look at my hand and because it changed when it, it was just too, my brain couldn't take it. And so I would write down, and also I can't see, I like blind in my right eye, no joke. And so I, it was just such a disaster. Um, I remember going to my eye doctor saying, I need the best contacts for me to be able to see Sharpie on my hand on stage, literally. And she was like, never been asked for this before. We're gonna figure this out. <laughs> anyway, so I would, I would look at my hand for the bullet points of the scene and we would get through it. And I literally, the night before we opened um, uh, was the, was obviously the night, or the night before the New York Times came, which is like, was like the night before our official opening. They, uh, there were critics in the house, critics in the house. And I was reading the Sharpie off of my hand. And so, you know, I, I, chal I challenge anyone to please enjoy that in their career. It made me a better actor, that's for sure. It made me like, you know, try to learn lines very quickly. And it also made me like namaste, like it, whatever is gonna happen is gonna happen. And thank God for John Cariani, who is a brother to me forever. And he dug me out of many a trench. And, um, and that once we froze it, then I really started to have fun. But I was like basically your, your diarrhea gal um, for however many weeks that lasted. I was so thin. I look back on those pictures and I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. Um, I never want to be that thin again. Cause I, I remember my dresser was like, we have to take your costume in again. And she was like, Heidi, we have to figure out how to feed you. And I remember she would like bring me all kinds of stuff and I couldn't eat. It was, it was trucks. Um, it was it was a little uh, traumatizing, but once we opened, it was a delight. And I really did start to have fun. So you've done um, a lot of work regionally. You've done a lot of work here in DC. Uh, you got a Helen Hayes for Meet John Doe at Ford's Theater, and you also did uh, Freaky Friday at SIG. So can you take us and our audience through the differences of creating a show regionally versus creating a show for Broadway? <laughs> um, well, you know, they're all like little snowflakes, you know, I, I don't know that there's like a, you know, a list of regular things that happen when you're building a Broadway show versus building a regional show. I mean, when I was doing Meet John Doe at Ford's, which to this day remains one of my most treasured experiences ever. Um, and that was, that was um, I think that was right after I, I was done with title of show and I was done with Ursula. And that was my first job after, after that. And, um, uh, that whole experience was just astounding. Um, Andrew Gerla and Eddie Sugarman who wrote Meet John Doe are both such um, thoughtful, remarkable, talented artists. And um, the fact that they trusted me with her, the show is based on a Frank Capra movie, an old black and white Frank Capra movie of the same title. And um, it's really beautiful if you haven't seen it. It's, it's such a great, I mean, Frank Capra was a master. Um, but getting to do that show, um, building it from the ground up really, um, and playing a part like that, playing a part like a serious part. You know, I think a lot of people now know me for, I don't know, maybe I'm lying, but it feels like I've, I'm kind of known for having like comedic chops and I'm the girl with the big belt and, mm -hmm. and I'll take all of that um, that I just donned on myself. Um, but I also, my, I have a passion for uh, dramatic roles too. And Meet John Doe was certainly that. And, um, you know, the, the art, the artistry that went into building that show, not just obviously from the, the 
performative side, but also all of the designers. Like um, I remember the costumer Alejo, which is just like this remarkable guy, costumed me in this way. I'm I'm not a tiny girl. I've never been like a size two. I'm I'm you know I'm a I'm a formidable woman, and um, uh, I remember he motorcycles in my neighborhood, you guys. Um, <laughs> he he showed me some sketches of um, this beautiful silk dress, just this like naked gray silk dress that he wanted to put on me. And I was like, Alejo, that is never gonna work on me. I don't think that's gonna work on me. He was like, I got you, boo boo. You, you trust <laughs> me, trust me. And he was like, if it's a mess, we won't do it. And he put that thing on me and it was the most, it was like skin. I never looked better in my life. Uh, he also like this, I'm not necessarily proud of this, but this is one of the things that get, that happens sometimes when, when you're in a big show that has a big budget like me, John Doe did. Um, I, the character in the show, uh, uh, her career starts to get, it starts to accelerate more and more because she's told this lie. It's a long story. Watch the movie. Um, listen to the cast album that's out there too um, um, anyway she's she starts to make more money and she buys herself a fur coat and Alejo took me to a furrier in Manhattan and I first of all I felt like I mean I'm such a huge animal lover so I was like is someone gonna like throw red paint on me when I walk out of here <laughs> but um, but we went in and um, I got to try on um, many beautiful fur coats and I got to pick the one that I ended up wearing on stage and that doesn't really happen in real life um you know same thing for Freaky Friday I remember the movie they I went to a bridal like I'm old and married I wasn't ever gonna be a bride again but when we were in Vancouver filming the movie the production team took me to this beautiful bridal gown place and tried on all of these gowns on me and I'm sitting there and I'm 40 whatever I am and I'm like <laughs> how did I end up here it's like fairy tale land but sometimes you get to have these wonderful experiences I'm getting off track but it's basically the same building building a regional show and building a Broadway show are very similar because you know I'm pretty positive I am actually am positive that they intended me John Doe to come in and for a billion different reasons and when I say come in I mean come into New York and for a billion different reasons it didn't and um but it's such a great show. Every now and then I'm like, that show should still come in. It's so, it's so great. I hope someday it does. Um, but you know, you, you pour your blood, sweat and tears into it and you, you make a musical baby and um, you hope for the best. But really, as I'm thinking about it, it, it is no different. I mean, maybe with something rotten, we felt a little more pressure because it was, I mean, I certainly felt pressure for the half hour long answer I gave you before, but um, title of show, we had five years to figure that out. It takes a long time to make a Broadway show. And I do think that that Me John Doe was kind of like at Ford's, it was not, it wasn't intended to be a, a, a pre-Broadway tryout as, as really happens now, that definitely happens. Um, but I'm sure that they, they were eyeing, you know, that was the next step on their fairy tale journey and it just didn't happen for whatever reason. So it's really similar, you know? Yeah. And I've been lucky enough to create, I can't believe that I have created the roles that I have created. You know, again, that's another that's another thing that I'm sort of like, how did I get that lucky? Because God knows there are so many talented people in this town, and um, for some reason, I've been the lucky girl to be able to create a handful of them. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. So, just wrapping up um, for our audiences, many you know, comprised of up and coming artists, current students. You know, it's been a um, as you know, we discussed earlier, a, a, a pretty difficult time to navigate through and you've been doing some teaching and um, continuing to you know, keep up with your craft. So um, 
how have you, how did you find your voice as an actress in the you know New York City theater scene? And then combined with that, what advice can you offer to these students and up and coming artists, you know, for their own careers going forward? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, my answer is kind of the same for both questions, which is um, there is magic in tapping into your you-ness. And um, I, for many years, uh, I think that I tried to, I, I tried to emulate other people and I felt, you know, a lot of times you get asked what role, if you could do any role, what role would that be? And I, you know, it was anything that, anything that Alice Ripley did, anything that Emily Skinner did, anything that Adina Menzel did. And I was not thinking, I want to create, I want to, I want to be the person that is, um, first, because I'm pretty sure all of those people are amazing and great. And they're the only ones that can be them. Someone's already busy being them. And so when I figured out nobody's busy being me, um, and if I can figure out how to be me and celebrate everything that only I can do. And I don't mean that in an egotistical way. All of us, snowflakes again, all of us come to the table with our unique abilities and no one else can be us. And so once I tapped into that, I was like, oh, so it's okay for me to not be a size two. It's okay for me to be me to celebrate my big German girlness and my strength and my humor and my vulnerability and make them laugh in the first act, make them cry in the second. Like I, I figured out where I fit in all of this. And I was like, only, only I can be me. And I do think as younger actors and myself included, we spend a lot of time wanting to be the people we idolize. And I, that's a great step. That's a great step in trying to figure out, uh, you know, like for me, it's no accident that my first Broadway show, Emily Skinner's mic was on my back because we are kind of similar. We, Emily and I are selling the same thing kind of, but not Emily can do a million things I can't and I can do some things Emily can't. And I think once you realize that you are the only you. You stop competing. Um, you stop sizing everybody up. And, and when you get to, you know, now when I get to an audition room and I see all the women that I'm kind of in the same echelon with, I'm always like, hey, it's never like, oh, you're here, Stephanie Block. Great. You know, <laughs> it's always like, oh my God, I hope you get this. <laughs> you know, it's it there is a certain thing where you're sort of like, if it's mine, it's mine. If it's yours, it's yours. It, and it, that is meant to be. And uh, you know, I know so many young actors, like they want something so badly. And um, when it doesn't happen, it's so devastating. And not that I haven't been devastated. I was, I, I was up for a pilot last year before the pandemic shut everything down. And it was between me and another person and the other person got it. And I cried, I cried. I wanted that TV money. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but I really am a believer in if it's, if it's not your job, it's not your job. And if it is meant for you, you cannot miss it. And um, you have to definitely make yourself the best version of yourself you can. You got to stay in shape. You got to take care of yourself. You have to surround yourself with non-assholes, supportive, awesome friends, family, dogs, other, other interests, hobbies, because the business will let you down time and time again. But once you've got you straight, then walk the path. Because if it 
is for you. You cannot miss it. And if it was not your job, it was never going to be your job. So I am, I have gotten to a much more namaste place with myself. And I, I try to tell my students that too, but I know there's some struggle bus, you know, we all have to ride that struggle bus for as long as we ride it in order to get to namaste Island. <laughs> I love it. Absolutely. Well, Thank you so much for that. Thank you for sharing your incredible career. Congratulations. It's been a, an amazing career to talk about. And I know that there's more amazing stuff to come. You. Um, you know, you've done so many cool gigs. Like I forgot, I saw you as um, an elf in, at Paper Mill. We went you on a did. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. <laughs> so this was so fun. Thank you so much for joining us again. Thanks guys, all the best to you as we eke out these last days and hello to your classmates and this is really great what you're doing and I was very happy to join you. Thank you so much and we'll stay in touch. Whatever's next, we'll be there. Thanks guys, have a good day. Thanks. Thank you. See you. Bye.